It was an interesting concert and, and a bit of a shambles in some ways and the sound wasn't great, but by the end of the show, if people have heard a recording of it or seen it, uh, there's a fantastic version of Sympathy for the Devil with a, a drum troupe helping out. And Ginger Johnson's, Ginger Johnson's African drummers, yeah, right. I don't and, know where we and found them. But. Suddenly at that stage, the whole thing, the band gels with, with Mick in the band yeah. live and he sort of yeah. becomes that integral member, which he was to be for a few yeah. years. And that led to them asking you to manage their US tour. Yeah, yeah, the to same be their tour manager, yeah. yeah. I mean, the great thing about the Rolling Stones, which, I mean, one of the reasons I love them musically, is that it's always, in a way, been a bit of a disaster with the Rolling Stones. It's always a struggle. You go and see the Rolling Stones, man, the Rolling Stones play, and it's like you look at them and think, is Keith going to drop dead? <laughs> You know what I mean? Is Mick going to make it? You know what I mean? It, it, you always get that feeling it's a struggle. They've got to work hard to make it happen. And you can actually see them on stage working hard to get the vibe right, to get the feel right, you know? I mean, I went to see the Eagles, oh, I don't know, two or three years ago. Somebody gave me this two, a pair of tickets, $600. I couldn't fucking believe it. I mean, I, I wouldn't have paid $6, let alone 600 But they gave me a pair of fucking tickets to see the Eagles. Down I went, I was in three rows from the front, and it was like watching these perfect little robots. And they played the music, and it was exactly like it is on the record, and it was all perfect. But they had absolutely kind of no humanity, no sense of frailty or the possibility of failure attached to it. Whereas with the Stones, it's always been a struggle for them, you know, because they don't really rehearse. They're not a kind of rehearsing band. So anyway, at that show in Hyde Park, yeah, it was... A, it was it was dreadful. They were out of tune and out of time and everything, but there was a great amount of um, goodwill for the Rolling Stones. There was half a million people there, and there were half a million people there celebrating the fact that, you know, even though Brian had died, the band had survived, you know, and they'd had all their bus and their hassles and everything, and they'd still survived, and there wasn't one policeman there. And actually, as a result of that show, where, you know, as I say, half a million people were at it, they would never ever had any hassles ever again in England because people realised, I mean, the authorities, the, the, the people who, like, the establishment realised that the Rolling Stones were actually very, very uh, loved, I guess is the word, you know, were, were, were loved by the, the, the youth of that, that time and um, were, yeah, were, were, were important to people. So that they, from then on in England, they were never busted or, or, or harassed. And uh, yeah, I went to America with them, so that, that was great. Well, that tour later in the year in 69 was one of the great rock and roll tours of all time. In fact, it probably set the template for stadium tours that were to follow for years to come. It produced maybe the greatest live album of rock and roll album of all time. Um, get your yayas out and, and culminated eventually in Altamont. But till that stage, the tour had been going really, really well, apart from the fact that I noticed that Ralph Gleason in San Francisco criticised the band for the ticket prices, which is probably what led partly to them deciding to do a free concert. At yeah, the well, end it's of the funny, year. isn't it? See, because the ticket prices, yeah, they fucking moan like crazy about the ticket prices. And looking back on it, I mean, you have to laugh because the top ticket price was eight dollars, <laughs> and everyone, what a fucking rip off, eight dollars for a, you know, oh man, you know, I don't know what it is now, four hundred dollars or something. But anyway, it was eight dollars, and Ralph Gleason just went on and on and on about how. Uh, the Rolling Stones had ripped off black music and they should be giving money to black people, you know, because, you know, they were playing, like, black music. I don't know quite where that came from, but that's what he said. And the, the ticket prices were a total rip-off. And the Stones were, were very sensitive to that, that as, a, as a, you know, a charge, as it were, that had been put to them. And the, the Grateful Dead, a guy from the Grateful Dead had come to England after we played the free concert in Hyde Park he arrived in England, a guy called Rock Scully, and hung out, old dear brother and friend of mine, and talked to Keith and hung out with Keith and did all the nasties with Keith and basically persuaded Keith that the thing to do when you come to America is play a free concert in California because that's what people do. So that became a kind of an answer to the charge that the Rolling Stones were rip-offs, you know, and, and that, that all they wanted to do was take as much money as possible out of America. 
So yeah, the the dread idea of a free concert in America, be, you kind of got embedded in people's consciousnesses, and yeah, and of course, as we found out to our cost, a free concert in America is a very different proposition to a free concert in England. I mean, in England, man, we had quite half a million people. The um, you know, like the medical facilities were two old ladies, bless them, from the uh, St. John's Ambulance <laughs> Society, you know. And if you fainted, because it was rather a hot day, you know, they gave you a cup of tea and a biscuit, and everything was cool, you know. And I think they dealt with maybe 10 people or something like that, you know what I mean? And there was a doctor, because I remember seeing him, he had a stethoscope and walked around looking very important, and in the end felt like a complete prick. And, took his stethoscope off and hid it so nobody kind of would know. You know, it was all very gentle and kind of civilised and very there are a lot different. Of, there are a lot of interesting people involved in the organisation of the Ultimate Concert. Well, let's have a look at a, a clip from, from the movie and we'll come back and okay. have a chat about that if you'd like can, to Yeah, I'd love to, us. but I'd love to set the scene for it because what you'll see is is... is a bunch of people who really don't look like they have anything to do with rock and roll as such, you know. So there's nobody that's kind of looks like a hippie, nobody that's got long hair, and it's all very kind of big, powerful um, offices and powerful people talking. And none of these people that are talking so um, confidently upon the part, on, be, on upon behalf of the Rolling Stones actually have any legal or moral right whatsoever to be talking upon their behalf. There were some very interesting people involved in the organisation of the concert, Sam. Some of them not so pleasant as you were to later find out. Yeah, I mean, the, the interesting thing, of course, I mean, to me, you know, when you look at that, there's three of the guys there are mafia people, not, you know, criminals, mafia, genuine mafia people. And what was going on here was an interesting thing. There was, you saw the guy with the beard who was saying, yeah, the Rolling Stones wanted to do a free concert and da 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 da, da. He was from the Grateful Dead, a guy called Rock Scully. You might have noticed I was, and there was another guy with long hair who was Michael Lang, who was actually the Woodstock. producer of Woodstock. Um, and they were there as the kind of, if you like, the hippie element that were trying to get this free concert together. Meanwhile, across town, the Mafia and Mel Belli, a very famous lawyer, were basically trying to control the thing and gain control not only of the concert but of the film because they knew a film was going to be made and it was all about money and power play. So there's these two elements, at loggerheads. One was the hippies who wanted it to be free and to be a beautiful thing. The other was the... the, the, the organized crime element who wanted to control the site and wanted to control the film. So it was a, of course it was a recipe, I mean, with the benefit of hindsight, it was a recipe for disaster. Well, it was originally supposed to be in Golden Gate Park and then moved to Sears Point and finally to Altamont, um, where it took place. How did the Hells Angels get involved? That was basically, you were, you organize that but it's sort I of had organized it hang on you no. helped to organize what happened yeah. was well, the there'd been a series of free concerts since 1966 in the panhandle in san francisco part of golden gate park where the uh, jefferson airplane the grateful dead uh, janice joplin and big brother and the holding company uh, um santana and pete crosby stills and nash and people had played in the past right and what happened was that the in order to have concerts there, they had to have generators to make the electricity. And they used to collect money and put the Hells Angels by the generators. The gener they would sit there, drink beer, and nobody basically would fuck with the generators because the angels would be there and the, you know, they were best left alone. So that was the kind of history of it.